The first presentation for today is by Ellen Angseth, Curator of the Immigration History Research Center Archives and Head of Migration and Social Services Collections. Her presentation is entitled, Record Building, Saving Culture, and Starting Archives, The Role of Organizations in the Experience of Displaced Persons. She will explore the roles of ethnically identifying organizations, both in their volunteer reception of displaced persons and in the empowering work of creating archives and sustaining cultures. Our second presentation is by Linnea Anderson, archivist for the Social Welfare History Archives. Her presentation is entitled, Power in the Archives, Contested Issues in the History of Social Work. The history of social work is also a history of power. To define norms, to determine who needs assistance and what help will be given, to assess and regulate behavior. Social workers, reformers, and client populations intersect and often conflict over some of the most contested societal issues. This talk will explore three of those issues, adoption, race and social welfare, and public assistance and welfare rights. So first, let's welcome Ellen and Seth. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, everyone, for coming. It's wonderful to see you today. Uh, my talk, let's see, works. Record Building, Saving Culture, and Starting Archives, the Role of Organizations in the Experience of Displaced Persons, is a melding of various interests and approaches. First, the rich collections of the Immigration History Research Center Archives, IHRCA in its acronym form, are full of the voices and the experiences of displaced persons, or DPs. We also have documentation of agencies and volunteer organizations who provided reception and resettlement services to these DPs upon their arrival in the United States. This category includes the records of ethnically identifying organizations, such groups as the American Fund for Czechoslovak Refugees and the United Ukrainian Fund uh, American Relief Committee. In addition, we have collected a library of primary and secondary sources including books and newspapers printed both in DP camps and uh, afterward around the diaspora. Since at least the late 1960s, our visionary predecessors in the immigrant archives, as we were then called, intentionally collected records and printed material created by DPs or those working with DPs. I'd like to thank my colleague Daniel Nietzsche, archivist at the IHRCA, for sharing his knowledge of our collections and for a formative conversation on this topic about a year ago, soon after my arrival as curator. I would also like to give due credit to two articles published on this topic, written by our former colleagues, published in the Immigration History Research Center's magazine and newsletter, Spectrum. Second, a professional interest of mine is the work of a wide variety of people engaged in <coughs> archival work, whether they label it as such or not. This certainly includes professional archivists and librarians and academics. I extend that recognition to the records creators themselves, complemented by friends, allies, volunteers, family members, and others who form a large community of people that I like to call citizen archivists. Third, in archives and special collections and in the libraries, we are considering issues of diversity and inclusion. Some of us think about this in regards to our collections and the very work that we do every day. I hold the opinion that the archival record can and does provide a voice to those who might not otherwise have such a public and enduring voice. Archives, libraries, and research collections of other sorts play an important role in empowering self or communities. This year's theme, Contested Spaces, Power in the Archives, provides us the opportunity to consider the role of archival records to power. We are thinking about how our collections document hard questions, contested spaces, and transformational moments in time. I will be sharing with you today some of the IHRCA's materials which document what were undoubtedly transformational moments of those people we know as displaced persons. And in the process, let's consider a few questions. Is the act of establishing an archives one of self or community expression? And if so, is it related to an expression of power or an act of self-empowerment? Many of the ethnic voluntary organizations who assisted DPs and which DPs themselves joined were interested in safeguarding the culture of their home countries. What was or is the role of archives in the effort to strengthen identity? What role did archival records play in this caretaking of culture? 
I'd like to note that the IHRCA's colleague archives in Migration and Social Services collections all provide primary sources on the experiences of DPs. Particularly, the Social Welfare History Archives includes material on legislation and the roles of social service agencies, such as the International Social Service, who played major roles in international voluntary and forced migrations via relocation assistance, international adoption, and citizenship work. This history is reflected well in our current gallery exhibit uh, just outside the door behind you, and we invite you to explore that today during the visit. I'll provide next a brief history of post-World War II displaced persons, ever so brief. Other terms used for these people will include exiles, refugees, and emigres. All of these labels designate uh, political immigrants who were forced to emigrate for political reasons or who fled their country to escape war and persecution. From 1933 through about the next 25 years, a great population upheaval occurred throughout the world, most heavily in the European theater of World War II. A staggering 45 million people fled their homes as the result of war and its related stresses. In Europe alone, when war ended in 1945, 13 million refugees were in need of resettlement and were living in displaced persons camps. Private and public agencies aided the majority of these people in returning to their homes. Start here, okay. However, approximately a million and a quarter one and a quarter million would not allow themselves to be repatriated to their homelands for fear of retribution or the living conditions under the dominating Soviets. The international community responded through planned resettlement of these people. American law, by 1952, allowed for the reception and resettlement of approximately 400,000 Europeans. And in 1956, following the Hungarian uprising, the US admitted a further 30,000 refugees. This permanent relocation of DPs and refugees involved very important work by not only general social service agencies, but also by existing or newly formed ethnic American organizations, many of whom reframed their work to support compatriot DPs from Central or Eastern Europe. Some were interested in assisting only those that they culturally or nationally identified with. These ethnic organizations located homes and jobs and provided the necessary assurances which were required by the U.S. Displaced Persons Act. The images you are viewing on the screen are from the Hugo Skratzen's papers. Hugo documented his own voyage from Bremerhaven, Germany to New York City aboard a displaced persons transport ship <coughs> in the summer of 1950. He'd spent the previous years in the displaced persons camp at Mearsbeck, Germany. Next, I'll share a few documents from the records of the United Ukrainian American Relief Committee, or UUARC. This organization formed in 1944 and was comprised of hundreds of civic, religious, educational, and fraternal organizations whose members were American citizens of Ukrainian descent. As did many other volunteer organizations, it provided assurances and reception services, including job placement, food, clothing, and medical aid. Approximately 50,000 Ukrainians coming to settle in the United States between 1947 and 1957 were aided by the UUARC, including Mr. John Panchuk, whose personal papers we have in the archives. Okay. Let's turn to the questions of the archival records themselves and of the maintenance of culture. When I proposed this talk many, many months ago, I included the phrase, saving culture, in quotes, as I was sure I had seen this exact phrase in an early look at pertinent documents. I expected to easily locate <laughs> this document again by March 6th. This has not proved to be the case. <laughs> and as is the experience of many an archival researcher, and a point we often make when teaching our research classes, this golden nugget proves elusive. Still, I can make the case, I think, that many of these DPs felt an understandable need to perpetuate the cultures of their homelands. As the primary sources show and secondary sources analyze, the goal of many organizations included, included aiding refugees, working for the reestablishment of free countries, and to provide for the continuation of the true culture of their homeland. 
For example, the Latvian Heritage Foundation recorded in none other than the congressional record that they were established to protect and preserve the centuries-old Latvian cultures, and that it is by preserving, developing, and educating that the continuance of Latvian culture will be assured. Um, this slide is a snapshot from the records of the Latvian chorus song Shield of Songs, which was a group formed in the DP camp at Groscherbersdorf, Germany, and who continued in Michigan, where many of its members resettled. A conductor's speech note reads, uh, coming over to this great country, everybody is taking something with him to contribute for his new homeland. Among other values, the Latvians took their culture and they want to preserve it because back in Latvia, now it is under the process of total destruction under the communism's brutality. A 1957 survey of Latvians living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, shows the community's collective goals to reestablish Latvia as a nation state free from Soviet domination, as well as a drive to display Latvian culture, which they attach to perpetuating that culture. 97% surveyed indicated that it is desirable to maintain Latvian culture in exile, even though such a task was not easy. Some of the phrases shown in italics here come close to and are certainly in the spirit of my elusive <coughs> phrase, saving culture. As Joe Worrell explained in the 1994 <coughs> issue of Spectrum, in, these homeland, in their homelands, these people had faced extreme cultural repression and reprogramming, which was aimed at clearly ending their distinctive national traits and culture. Thus, DPs carried with them a drive to reconstruct societies while in exile and in settled resettlement. Milda Danis writes, quote, they refused to admit that their cultures and countries had ceased to exist. They lived and acted as though they still had power over their own lives, unquote. In DP camps, they formed choirs and theaters, printing presses, schools, and services. And in these, identity work and cultural maintenance was very clear. This drive accompanied them as they later settled in the United States. Did this drive result in acts of building collections of records or establishing archival institutions? I see a clear connection. The immigrant archives as we were known then was collect actively collecting archival records and library material in the late 1960s, a few years after our formation. This means that there were donors, creators of records themselves, or collectors of such, working with our archives and agreeing that a deposit of their records had value. Donations to archives are sometimes acts of safeguarding, of ensuring continuity of information regarding culture, homeland, and one's own efforts in these areas. A clear example is provided by the formation and early history of an institution with which the IHRCA has a close working relationship, the Estonian Archives in the US, located in Lakewood, New Jersey. Their written history provides their impetus, impetus for creation. Quote, there was ample documented knowledge that the occupying USSR regime was systematically destroying written materials, documents, and literature from the period of Estonia's independence and forbidding free access to documents and to cultural heritage from earlier periods, end quote. In the 1940s, the idea of the Estonian American archives was under discussion in New York with the Estonian World Confederation, or EWC. Their broad aims included political activity to liberate Estonia from the USSR and to share information about the experience of Estonia. In 1950, they appealed to Estonian Americans to search their libraries as well as all <coughs> other printed matter from earlier times up to the period of independence before World War II and to donate materials to the newly formed archive of the EWC. At the same time, the EWC itself collected information about the Estonian American community in the USA. They found that an overwhelming abundance of preserved, collected, and deposited materials has come from Estonians who em immigrated to America from the DP camps, and that a substantial collection was in place and archived. It is this appeal from within the ethnically identifying community itself which provides to me uh, evidence of the recognized power of collecting records and of creating an archives. 
This archive evolved into the Estonian Archives in the U.S. by the 1970s, who was in part devoted exclusively to promote means and opportunities for the education of the public and to solicit, collect, preserve, and exhibit Estonian artifacts, <coughs> books, and all materials concerning Estonian culture and heritage. A director of the Estonian Archives described it in these words, quote, it is quite obvious that the Estonians who live outside their communist-ruled homeland feel that they have a certain mission to fulfill. Generally speaking, they feel that they have some kind of obligation to do something for their Estonia that once was free. This feeling finds its expression in many different ways, be it polit political or cultural activity. One example of this activity is the collection of historical data and documents to provide objective information for the future historians. Sometimes I feel, however, that this may not be the only objective, and that there is an underlying purpose to this careful documentation to show that we have tried to fulfill our mission to Estonia." End quote. From a different arena regarding Ukrainian collecting, I'll share a brief excerpt regarding activity to save printed material. According to Roman Ilnishki, writing on the Ukrainian diaspora press, praise belongs to Volodymyr Miyakovsky, organizer of the museum, and archives of the Ukrainian Free Academy of Sciences. This was established in Augsburg, Germany in 1945. He was the first Ukrainian activist to realize the need for an emigre press center during the middle of the 20th century. Miyakovsky himself said, the Ukrainian Museum and Archives has taken on the function of a book center. By collecting six copies of each piece of printed material, it saves newspapers and other publications from total oblivion. For with the great demand at present for the printed word, newspapers, journals, and books sell out extraordinarily quickly and are read to the point of disintegration. Again, we see here evidence of the importance of collecting and a clear connection with activism, action, and the savings of, saving of one's culture. And so my research for today's presentation was conducted almost exclusively within IHRCA's collection with help from Wilson Library. I hope you too have found it interesting to consider the roles of ethnically identifying organizations both in their volunteer work to receive and resettle displaced persons and in the empowering work of creating archives and sustaining cultures. Thank you.